Right, so this is Neo-Confucianism and Chinese Buddhism. This is the start of week five and I'm Professor Van Norden. So last week we looked at some of the distinctive features of early Indian Buddhism. And I noted in passing that there's a distinction between Theravadan Buddhism, which became dominant in Southeast Asia and Sri Lanka and Mahayana Buddhism, which became dominant in East Asia, uh, including Tibet, China, Korea, Japan, um, and also Vietnam, although Vietnam's normally classified as part of, part of Southeast Asia. Uh, but I didn't talk very much about what the distinction is between Mahayana and Theravada. And so I'm gonna talk some more about that at the beginning of today's lecture. And just out of sight, Pinky has decided she's gonna take up a position here. So let me introduce my cat, Pinky. She's gonna be beneath the camera, I think, most of today, but I just thought I'd give you a quick look at her. So that's my cat, Pinky. Um, and I'm moving some of the things, she's moving with her tail out of the way. So again, we're gonna talk a little bit about the difference between Mahayana and Theravada Buddhism. Now, Theravada Buddhism is, uh, Theravada means way of the elders. Mahayana means greater vehicle. There's a, for various historical reasons, people in the West, especially in the United States, tended to learn more about Mahayana Buddhism than they did about Theravada Buddhism historically. And they tended to, as a result, see things from a Mahayana Buddhist perspective. Uh, and that included using Mahayana Buddhist ways of explaining what the differences are between Mahayana and Theravada. So for example, when I was first learning about Buddhism, I learned that there were two kinds of Buddhism, Mahayana and Hinayana. And I, and I learned that Mahayana meant greater vehicle and Hinayana meant lesser vehicle. And I remember at the time, like writing a marginal note in my book and saying, you know, gee, I'm surprised that advocates of Hinayana Buddhism you know, why don't they mind being called the lesser vehicle? That kind of surprises me. Well, it turns out they do mind. And Hinayana, you shouldn't use the term. I'm teaching it to you because it's historically important enough and you'll run across the term Hinayana in Mahayana Buddhist writings about the other school. But it's really not a term you should use because Hinayana, as you might guess from the name, is a derogatory term. It means lesser less encompassing, less profound than Mahayana, which is the greater vehicle. So a better term to use for, uh, in distinction from Mahayana, we can talk about Theravada Buddhism, which means the way of the elders. But the fact that when I was learning about Buddhism as an undergraduate, I was taught you should refer to Theravada as Hinayana, reflects the fact that it's hard to describe the difference between Mahayana and Theravada Buddhism in a way that isn't overtly sectarian. Now, what does sectarian mean? Sectarian just means it's, a, it's something that is based on the distinctions between different sects within a movement. So for example, if you went to a, a Roman Catholic theologian and you asked them to explain the difference between Roman Catholic Christianity and Protestant Christianity, you would probably get a different answer than you would if you went to say an American Baptist theologian, um, a Baptist theologian and ask them to describe the difference between Protestantism and Catholicism. Why? Because they each give a sectarian view of what the disagreement is. So one that makes sense from the perspective of their sect, but it's hard to give a neutral description. So it's the same thing with Buddhism. It's hard to give a description of the differences between Mahayana and Theravada that isn't sectarian, like the one that I was given as an undergraduate where I was taught without any compunction that, oh, Theravada is the lesser vehicle. And that's, that's because Americans had learned about Buddhism from Mahayana Buddhists, so they absorbed this Mahayana Buddhist way of talking. Um, now, and again, as, you, as, uh, as I always say, if you are a Buddhist, you're entitled to understand your tradition, whatever way you want. I'm just telling you things as an outsider that these are, you know, things that I notice as a, a scholar studying this from the outside. So what are 
the, the differences between Mahayana and Theravada Buddhism. Um, one of the classic ways to mark the distinction, and this is what I was taught again as an undergraduate is, well, Theravada emphasizes the ideal of the Arhat, whereas Mahayana emphasizes the ideal of the Bodhisattva. There's some truth to that, but I also learned that that's a very sectarian way uh, of, of putting the distinction. I think a more genuine, uh, like less sectarian way of putting the distinction is that it's on the issue of, is it metaphysically turtles all the way down? Theravadan Buddhists are inclined to say, no, it's not. It bottoms out in something. And Mahayana Buddhists are more likely to say, well, no, it's, it is turtles all the way down. I'm gonna go over each of these points in more detail. So don't worry if I'm just giving you like a quick overview of what these issues are. If you're feeling like I don't understand what you're talking about yet, that's okay. These are just placeholders for things I'm gonna talk about more in detail in a second. So what distinguishes Theravada from Mahayana? Well, traditionally people, at least in the Mahayana tradition, they'll say, well, the Theravadans have the ideal of the Arhat, the Mahayanists have the ideal of the Bodhisattva. I think it is true that Theravadan Buddhists are more likely to think that it is not turtles all the way down, that reality grounds in something real. Whereas Mahayana Buddhists are more likely to say, no, there's no ultimate ground. Um, I think that it's also true that we see in Mahayana a greater use of upaya, skillful means, which we talked about last time. And I think it's true that in Mahayana, we see a greater emphasis on faith and the notion of the transfer of merit from Buddhas, enlightened beings to unenlightened creatures becomes a feature of Mahayana. And in particular, when we're talking about Chinese or other forms of East Asian Mahayana, the notion of no self is still central to the tradition but they start to think in the East Asian Mahayana tradition that there's no individual self. So in a, a sense, they think there's a self, but it's a transpersonal self. So they would agree with the slogan, no self, but they'd say, well, what that means is there's no individual self. What leads to suffering and problems is the belief that you've got an individual self and you don't. So look, we're gonna look now, look at each of these things in a bit more detail. First of all, the ideal of the Arhat versus the Bodhisattva. So a classic way of putting the difference between Theravadan Buddhism and Mahayana is to say, well, the spiritual ideal of Theravada is the Arhat, whereas the spiritual ideal of Mahayana is the Bodhisattva. Um, and the reason I was playing it in the beginning there, the clip from Steely Dan's song Bodhisattva is that it's, it's not a deep song, but it's a fun song uh, in, written in honor of the ideal of the Bodhisattva. So an arhat is someone who has achieved enlightenment, but their goal is to achieve enlightenment in a sense for themselves. Now, of course, you don't have a self according to Buddhism, but there's a way in which the, the goal of the arhat is to end the flame of attachment which goes with their, their current body and snuff that out. Whereas the ideal of the bodhisattva is someone who says, well, since there's no self, I can't aim to eliminate suffering just for myself. I have to aim to eliminate suffering for all sentient beings. I have to try to eliminate suffering in general, not just for my so-called individual self. And this is, like I say, this is a textbook thing, at least I was taught when I was an undergraduate, that, well, you know, Theravadan Buddhism, that's just about achieving in enlightenment for individual people and ending one particular stream of suffering, whereas Mahayana has the more encompassing ideal of the Bodhisattva who wants to end suffering for all human beings. And it's true that the notion of the bodhisattva gets more play, gets you know emphasized perhaps more in Mahayanist writings, but certainly there are Theravadan Buddhists who work to alleviate the suffering of others. There are Theravadan Buddhists who build hospitals and orphanages um, to care for the sick and to care for you know children who have no one else to care for them. 
Um, so it's really not a, a sharp distinction. But as a matter of emphasis, you know, it's worth understanding the difference between an arhat and a bodhisattva. Um, so what is a, a bodhisattva? Basically, a bodhisattva recognizes there is suffering and there is happiness, but there are no selves, no individual selves who suffer or are happy. Now, suffering is bad, so it should be prevented. And happiness is good, so it should be promoted. But suffering and happiness do not belong to any selves. Consequently, there's no reason to prefer preventing my suffering to preventing, sorry, that got cut off a little. There's no reason to prevent, uh, prefer preventing my suffering to preventing your suffering. There's no reason to prefer promoting my happiness to promoting your happiness because there's no me and there's no you. We should just prevent all suffering and promote all happiness. And a being committed to preventing all suffering and preventing all suffering and promoting all happiness is simply called a bodhisattva. And there's a very moving description of what a bodhisattva is like in a work by the Indian Buddhist uh, Shantideva. Um, and this is an artistic representation of the bodhisattva Manjusri, the bodhisattva of infinite compassion. And near the end of uh, Shantideva's uh, Bodhikaryavatara, it says, may my own conduct emulate that of the bodhisattva Manjusri who works to achieve the welfare of all living beings throughout the 10 directions of space. Oops, sorry. As long as space abides and as long as the world abides, so long may I abide, destroying the sufferings of the world. Whatever suffering is in store for the world, may it all ripen in me. May the world find happiness through all the pure deeds of the bodhisattvas. So the, the bodhisattva ideal is someone who wants to alleviate suffering for all sentient creatures, all the suffering in the world, regardless of who it supposedly belongs to because there are no selves. And like I say, the, the arhat, and you'll, you know, uh, in the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, they will talk about arhats and arhat, to be an arhat is to have achieved something very great, but there's an implication that ironically, it's kind of a selfish ideal because you're still trying to alleviate suffering just for yourself. So, and again, this way of distinguishing Mahayana from Theravada is kind of sectarian, but you do find a distinction in all Buddhist writings between bodhisattvas and arhats. So it's worth knowing that distinction. Now, another issue that I think is a more substantive disagreement that you genuinely do find a substantive disagreement on this uh, in between Mahayana versus Theravada is, is it turtles all the way down? So think about in an earlier lecture, how we talked about this famous uh, philosophical joke about the, you know, the teacher says, well, the earth is supported on the back of a turtle um, as it moves around uh, the universe. And that's why there's apparent motion of the earth. And then the student says, what's the turtle on? It's on another turtle asks, what's that turtle on? It's on another turtle. Finally, the master in frustration says, look, it's turtles all the way down. And I said, there's a lot, this actually is revealing of a lot of different kinds of philosophical puzzles because it both seems that we do, and that, but yet we cannot, it seems sometimes, have a ground for everything else, a basis, a foundation for everything else that is not itself grounded in something further. So if you ask, is it turtles all the way down when it comes to reality? In other words, is, if we say there are no selves, there's no Van Norden, there's just transient physical and mental states. Well, are those transient physical and mental states real? Um, or do we just keep going down and everything is dependent on something else? The Theravadan answer classically is no. It's not turtles all the way down. Things are grounded. What are they grounded in? Everything's grounded in instances of the five skanda, the five aggregates. And we talked about these in a previous lecture. There's transient material form. So if you want, wanted to think of this from the perspective of contemporary physics, you could say that uh, there are configurations of mass energy in space-time at a particular instant. 
But as we know from contemporary physics, reality is always changing. Mass energy is always changing its configuration. So boom, it's gone in just a second. But there really is a configuration of mass energy in space-time at a particular instant. There are feelings, sensations, and other experiences, perceptions, conceptual recognition experiences of things, mental formations, the motivational states you have, whatever you think those might be, and consciousness, awareness of your own mental states. And so what the Theravada Buddhists say is, look, there aren't selves the way you thought there were, right? Van Norden is not an ultimate constituent of reality any more than Vassar College is an ultimate constituent of reality. In other words, if you did an inventory of everything that exists in the universe, not just things we talk about, but things that really exist, what would be on that list? Well, Sherlock Holmes or uh, Luke Skywalker or Darth Vader um, would not be on the list of things that really exist because those are fictional things. But neither, you'd say, is Vassar College on a list of things that really exist. Vassar College isn't a separate thing in the universe on top of everything else that exists. Vassar College is just a convenient way for talking about the way that things that really exist behave or what well, they do things. But what if Van Norden and you are also fictions in a similar way? I don't really exist. Well, but is there something that exists that accounts for the illusion of Van Norden? The Theravadan Buddha says, yes, their perceptions, feelings, temporary configurations of matter, those are real. They're transient, they're temporary, they're causally dependent on other things, but they're real even though they're transient, but they're the things that are real. They're the ground of everything else. But of course, a transient physical state isn't a self as we understand a self. A transient feeling isn't a self as we conventionally understand a self. So the Theravadan Buddhists are gonna say, no, you don't have a self, but there are things that are real. They're just these transient physical and mental states. So it's not turtles all the way down. But interestingly, in many forms of Mahayana, uh, particularly Indian Mahayana, the answer is yes, it is turtles all the way down. And one of the classic formulations of this is given by the great Indian Buddhist philosopher Nagarjuna, uh, who lived, uh, he died in the third century BC, we're not sure exactly when, but sometime in the third century of the common era. And philosophers like Nagarjuna have a pretty interesting argument against the Theravadan view. So what people like Nagarjuna say to the Theravadans is they say, well, look, you say that, for example, a particular configuration of matter is real. It has an identity, uh, even though it's transient. And the Theravadans say, yes, that these are, this is what grounds everything else. Well, but a particular configuration of matter that only exists because there was a different configuration of matter an instant before that causally produces this configuration of matter, correct? Yes. And this configuration of matter, its, it, its significance for the universe depends on the fact that it produces later states. Right? There's not, nothing to, if we'd stripped away from a material state all its causal properties, there wouldn't be anything left. So all a particular configuration of matter is, is the result of previous causal states and itself the cause of future causal states. And so far the Theravada Buddhist is gonna say, yeah. But then someone like Nagarjuna is gonna say, but then by the same kinds of arguments by which you argued against the reality of Van Norden, against the reality of the chariot, against the reality of Van Norden's Prius, by the same arguments, you can show that those configurations of matter don't exist because they don't have an identity independent of the identity of other physical states. So there's no physical state in the universe which is completely freestanding and independent of everything else. Every material state depends on other material state 
for its characteristics and its existence. So therefore, nothing really exists independently of every, anything else. So one slogan that Buddhists will use to talk about the doctrine of no self is the doctrine of emptiness. They'll say that things are empty of a self. Things are empty of an independent self. And then the idea is that if I'm empty, Van Norden is empty of a self because he's dependent on instances of the five aggregates. The five aggregates are also empty because they're dependent for their existence on other physical and mental states. And then in an effort to argue against Nagarjuna's view, people said, well, Nagarjuna, if we're gonna take seriously this notion that it's turtles all the way down, there's no ultimate ground or basis of reality. There are no independently existing things that ground everything else. Wouldn't that apply to Buddha's teachings as well? And wouldn't that apply to your teaching as well? And famously, Nagarjuna said, yes, yes, it would. And so the doctrine of emptiness is itself empty. And the emptiness of emptiness, the notion that there is no ultimate ground of Buddhist doctrine, no ultimate ground of Nagarjuna's teaching, no ultimate ground of anybody's teachings is something that Nagarjuna accepts. And it's a really trippy notion. And it, it's funny because what I find among philosophers is it's really hard to adjudicate this disagreement between these two views, turtles all the way down or not turtles all the way down. Um, because some philosophers just think, and I, and I understand why they would think this, they say, look, there has to be something real that in the sense of independently existing, genuinely independently existing at the bottom of reality. There just has to be. Whereas other philosophers just kind of shrug and say, why? Why couldn't it be turtles all the way down? Because again, they're not, people like Nagarjuna aren't saying that nothing exists. They're not saying that nothing exists. They're saying that in the sense of being an independent individual that is not dependent on other things, in that sense, nothing exists. In that sense, nothing exists at all. But, and it's like that all the way down, even when it comes to the teachings of Buddhism itself, those teachings are themselves empty. Another characteristic of, a uh, thing that tends to be characteristic of Mahayana is you see a greater use of skillful means. And you'll remember from last time that we said the classic example of Upaya comes from the Lotus Sutra, pardon me. In the Lotus, in the Lotus Sutra, you have this ideal, uh, you're given a story about this, this rich man who saves his children from a fire by telling them that there's carts of toys and candy outside and there's not really, but it gets them out of the building and it saves them from suffering. And so it's, it's justified. So Paya is when you say something that technically speaking isn't literally true, but it's a good thing to say because it helps people get closer to achieving enlightenment or it, comes, it helps them avoid suffering. You certainly find that in Theravada Buddhism, but you find even more use of upaya skillful means in Mahayana Buddhism. And this is one of the reasons I think it's able to spread very quickly because the, for example, one of the things that Mahayana Buddhists will do is they will adopt gods in local traditions as Buddhas. So if you ask some Buddhists, and you say to them, you know, what do you think about Jesus Christ? You say, if you're a Christian, you go to a Buddha, what do you think about Jesus Christ? And, and he's very enlightened. I think Jesus was a Buddha. And they're like, there's no problem saying that. It's just like, okay, this is how you conceptualize enlightenment. Great. Jesus was enlightened. Jesus was a Buddha, right? Or Lao Tzu. Lao Tzu was a Buddha too. Confucius, Buddha, boom. And some Buddhists will think this is literally true, but other ones will say, well, it may not be literally true that Jesus is a Buddha, an enlightened being, um, because he believed in the self and believed he was the son of God. But 
it's upai, it's a way of helping people get closer to the truth by putting things in terms that they would understand. So um, like I'm watching, I don't know if you guys saw this, there's a, a show Vikings, uh, I think it just ended its run, but it's, it's a historical drama set in I think the eighth century uh, where Vikings are starting to invade England. And so you're getting the first interactions between the Norsemen um, who are pagans and the Christians who live in England. And one of the ongoing tensions is between the Christian belief in God and the Norse belief in their pagan gods. And you can already see, and this is not a historical show, it's just kind of a fun drama, but you can see people kind of building towards saying, oh, okay, so God the Father is Odin and the Virgin Mary is Freya and uh, Thor, the son of Odin, is Jesus. And so you can see them moving towards saying that when I'm sure at some point that happened as, as Christianity you know, encountered other traditions, but it absolutely happened for sure as Buddhism encountered other traditions. It, is, is Buddhism a religion that emphasizes God or gods? No, it's not. But when it encountered local traditions where they believed in gods, they'd say, oh yeah, no, we believe in those gods too. No problem. Yeah, in fact, they're all enlightened beings. No problem. And there's, there's nothing wrong with saying that because it's an example of upaya, skillful means, where you say something to help people get closer to enlightenment. And some of the forms this took of upaya took were really cool. So for example, I mentioned in a previous lecture, I visited Halpar Villa in Singapore. I've got a ton of pictures, if you're curious, a lot of pictures. Um, uh, and there's a whole hell section in Halpar Villa that shows these gruesome punishments in hell for people. Now, again, if you're, if you understand the philosophy of Buddhism and you're like, well, I don't have a self, so how could I have a self that could go to heaven or go to hell? And isn't the desire to go to heaven or to avoid hell a kind of attachment, a craving for permanence, which Buddhism is designed to um, help me escape? Yeah, but Mahayana Buddhists were very happy to say, look, if believing in heaven or hell is a belief that gets you closer to enlightenment or helps alleviate suffering or helps you avoid doing things that will produce more suffering, well, great, let's just go ahead and, and teach that. So we see greater emphasis on upaya, skillful means in Mahayana. Also, we see a lot of interesting uh, developments in terms of meditative techniques. So again, meditation is part of Buddhism right from the beginning. The Buddha, un, it said the Buddha was meditating under a Bodhi tree when he realized the Four Noble Truths. And so meditation is central to Buddhism, but people developed a lot of interesting new forms of meditation, which you might broadly describe as upaya just because they're tools for helping you to achieve enlightenment. So, uh, and this is particularly in like Tibetan Buddhism, there's a lot of emphasis on visualization techniques. If you've ever done meditation that involves visualization, that's related to this. The notion of a tulpa, which I've recently gotten really interested in, is related, is also kind of an upaya. A tulpa is a being that you create in meditation through intense concentration. And it's interesting, I, I guess Slender Man, the Slender Man meme is kind of passe now, so forgive the old guy from bringing up an old meme, but some people have talked about Slender Man as a tulpa. You know, they borrowed this meditative, and the idea is that in a way, Slender Man, although obviously made up, becomes real when enough people believe in Slender Man. <laughs> and so that's not exactly the original Buddhist notion, but people will use this term tulpa from the Tibetan tradition to, to talk about this. Uh, mandalas, particularly, this is an image of a sand mandala. And pre-pandemic, we actually had some Tibetan Buddhist monks who did a sand mandala in, uh, uh, I can't remember, this main building. Uh, or it might have been College Center, one of the two. They did a huge sand mandala. And a sand mandala is you use colored sand to make a beautiful work of art like this. This is a sand mandala. But the whole thing about a sand mandala is 
it's made out of sand. So it's not permanent. And this beautiful thing is going to be swept away at the end of the day. But that's part of the message that you put all this effort into something that you know is transient. And at the end of the day, it gets swept away. And you're like, everything's like that. So that's a really cool, you know, kind of uh, meditative lesson. Another example of Upai is koans, which we're going to be talking about a lot in a couple of weeks when we get to Zen or Chan Buddhism, which are the most famous koan. Everybody should know this koan. What is the sound of one hand clapping? Um, we'll talk about koans a lot, but like part of your general education, you should, somebody says, what is the sound of one hand clapping? You know, oh, you're, they're making a reference to a koan. What's a koan? It's a kind of meditative technique in a way, a kind of skillful means for helping people to achieve enlightenment. And also sex. There's uh, an aspect of, and this is a, a genuine Buddhist uh, a statue. Um, there is, especially in what's called tantric Buddhism, which is a kind of Mahayana. Um, and, and it's part of what's sometimes called the third form of Buddhism, Vajrayana, which involves things like sand mandalas and creative vis visualization and tulpas. Uh, but like I say, you could really classify this as a form of, of Mahayana. But in this, there are parts of Mahayana tradition that say sexual activity can be a form of meditative practice that can help you achieve enlightenment. Um, and people who, again, uh, Buddhologists, people who study Buddha know there's a danger because this is such a striking idea that, oh, wait a second, actually having sex could be a meditative practice. People get really interested in it. It's worth emphasizing. It's just one small part of a particular kind of Buddhism. Um, you know, it's just because people just focus on this because it is interesting and this is a very erotic um, you know, a sculpture. Uh, but there, there is this, you know, tradition of you know, a way in which sexuality can be incorporated into meditative practices, often associated with tantric Buddhism. And again, people who study tantra often get really frustrated because they're like, there's so much more to tantra than the sex, which is absolutely true. But as part of your general education, you might occasionally hear about tantric sex or sexuality in relation to Buddhism. Generally, the view you get in Buddhism is that this is why Buddhist monks and nuns tend to be celibate, is that sexuality is a particularly strong form of attachment. And so it's you generally going to try to avoid it if you want to be enlightened. But it's complex because you do get aspects of the Buddhist tradition that say, no, you can certainly incorporate sexuality and enlightenment. So just keeping in mind, it's one of the ways this is this is very much a Mahayana a Buddhist, these various kinds of techniques are very much Mahayana Buddhist ways of looking at things. Also in the Mahayana tradition, a real emphasis on faith in the Buddha and the transfer of merit from Buddhas, enlightened beings, to lay people. That becomes a feature of Mahayana, particularly a very influential popular form of Buddhism called Pure Land Buddhism. And um, this notion that by chanting the name of a particular incarnation of the Buddha, a particular form of the Buddha, you can be reborn in the Pure Land, which is like heaven. This is very Mahayanist, and you, I don't think you would find this in the Theravadan tradition. So it's Mahayanist in several ways, the notion that the goal of your life should be to be reborn in the pure land, that's a, a kind of upaya. Because obviously the thought, oh, I'll live for eternity or at least for tens of thousands of years in the pure land, it seems like attachment to a permanent self. And what you're trying to overcome in Buddhism is precisely the attachment to a permanent self. But the idea is, well, you know, this might, your belief that you can do this might alleviate your suffering it might encourage you to do good things that would alleviate suffering for you and for others because you're trying to get into the good land. Yeah, so maybe it's, maybe it's good upaya. And also this notion that if you invoke the name of Amitofo Buddha, that the merit of the Buddha will be transferred to you 
and will give you a better reincarnation, that's a very Mahayanist way of thinking. And you see that in a lot of Mahayana Buddhism. You don't tend to see it so much in, in Theravada Buddhism. So, so that, and, and again, the notion of faith, this will become important also as we get into Neo-Confucianism and the, all these issues that we've been talking about actually, ironically, are gonna become important in Neo-Confucianism. Because what happens is the Confucian, Neo-Confucian tradition, We'll talk about this more later in the course, but the Neo-Confucian tradition is a reaction against the dominance of Buddhism. So the Neo-Confucians think they're fighting against Buddhism, but by the time they come along, they're so steeped in Buddhist ideas that they formulate a version of Confucianism that's highly influenced by Buddhist ideas. So we're gonna see the Neo-Confucian criticisms of Chinese Buddhism are a lot like the Mahayana critiques of Theravadan Buddhism. So for example, the Neo-Confucians say, we're trying to alleviate the suffering of all humans, whereas you Buddhists are just trying to alleviate suffering for yourselves. And that's precisely the objection the Mahayana Buddhists with the ideal of the Bodhisattva brought against the Theravadan Buddhists with the ideal of the arhat. And also this emphasis on faith, there's a way that we see in even the earliest Buddhism an emphasis on the intensity and the purity of your belief. Why is that? Well, look at me. I've been teaching Buddhism for decades. I've read lots of Buddhist sutras. I've read lots of Buddhist philosophical works. I've gone to retreats at Buddhist monasteries. I've done interviews with uh, like, a, a, what's it called, a dokusan, like an, a one-on-one -on -one with a, a Buddhist monk, not for academic purposes, but to help him, you know, ask him to help me achieve enlightenment. You know, I do the whole nine yards. Am I enlightened? No, I'm not. After all that, I'm not enlightened, right? Whose fault is that? A standard Buddhist thing to say is, well, you're not enlightened because you don't really have full belief in the Buddhist teachings. You can academically talk about these things, Van Norden, but you don't really believe in them, right? So the purity of the, the intensity and purity of your belief has always been important in Buddhism. But the, the emphasis on faith in the Buddha, believing in the Buddha becomes more central in Mahayana. In Theravada, they're saying, you don't have to accept this on faith. We can show you, it's gotta be true. But the notion that you just have to trust the Buddha and that the merit of the Buddha or of other enlightened beings could be transferred to you, this becomes central to later Buddhism. Then one, one last thing um, about Mahayana and Theravada, something interesting happens as Buddhism goes over the Himalayas and goes from India to, especially to China. This is less true in Tibet. A little side note here. At a certain point in history in Tibet, they the powers, the, the secular powers in Buddhism decided, we're going to import Buddhism and we are going to translate into Tibetan all the great scriptures in the Indian tradition. And they did that at once, just like they brought them over. So Tibetan Buddhism, pardon me, is in many ways like as Mahayana Buddhism was in India because there was a concerted effort to translate everything at once. And so they got a very systematic understanding of original Mahayana Buddhism in Tibet. In China, it was a little different because as, uh, I'm just talking historically here, I'm not taking a stance on the status of, of Tibet today, but culturally there was a difference because when Buddhism came to China, it came over in a more piecemeal fashion. The missionaries would go bring a few sutras, those are classic holy texts of Buddhism over. And so Buddhism didn't come over all at once, it came over in bits and pieces. So what happened was Chinese Buddhism ended up becoming very creative and original because it just got bits and pieces of Buddhism and was much more imaginative in how they incorporated these things and, and combined things that originally in the Indian tradition were not combined. 
So one of the interesting things that happened when Buddhism came to China is the way that people understood the doctrine of no self, anatman. Now, what does anatman mean? It literally just means no self, but that can mean a couple different things. If you say things are empty of selves, you could just say that. And I think that's what anatman originally meant in the Buddhist tradition, things that don't have selves. But the way it came to be understood in China is that things are empty of individual selves, but they do have a transpersonal self. Now, no Buddhist in India was going to say that. Why not? Because the notion that you don't have an individual self because you have a transpersonal self was characteristic of Advaita Vedanta. I mean, I think in, yeah, yeah, let's just say that, Advaita Vedanta, which is a kind of Hindu philosophy. Um, and this notion that you don't have an individual self, but you have a transpersonal self, you can find a version of this view in the Bhagavad Gita, for example, and in the Upanishads, the ancient uh, sacred texts of the Hindu tradition. And so a, a Buddhist in India is not going to say you have a transpersonal self because it sounds too much like the, the Vedanta position. But there's no Vedanta in China. So when Buddhism got to China, when people said you don't have an individual self, people interpreted that, that as, when, when they said you don't have a self, people interpreted that as, oh, I don't have an individual self. But they ended up arguing that you have a transpersonal self. This is not something that I think an original Indian Buddhist would have said, even a Mahayana Buddhist, certainly is not what a Theravadan Buddhist would say. So that's one way in which Mahayana Buddhism in China and then in Korea and Japan and Vietnam differed from earlier Indian Buddhism, even Indian Mahayana. This notion that you don't have an, it's, it, when you say there's no self, what you mean is you don't have an individual self, but you do have a transpersonal self.